Hello friends, Namaste. Welcome back to this course, the psychology of language and this is lecture number 8 in the series. Now, lecture number 7 focused on the production of speech and lecture number 8 is a continuation of that particular lecture where we look at how speech is uh, understood, what are the theories of uh, speech production which suggest how speech is produced and we will also look at speech production from a social aspects like uh, infant babbling and also uh, the various type of speech disorders. Now, before we go into the details of today's lecture, uh, let us take a journey back of how we started. So, we started off the journey by explaining what is the need for this course of psychology of language. So, we started off by explaining what is language and defining the meaning of language in terms of the very basic system of language which is called the animal communication. So, we looked at animal communication systems and the characteristics of that systems. We also looked at why animals communicate and later on we focused on the human language system. We looked at how human language system is different from the animal language system. We focused on how lang uh, the human language is built up right from the speech sounds to the morphemes, the simple words or word endings, the complete word formation, the sentence, the rules for sentence, the structure of sentence, this is syntax and grammar and also looked at how the discourse happened, that is talking between people. Now, since we have looked at the existence of language, we also dwelt a little bit into the history of language in that section and so we looked at how language evolved from Neolithic uh, humans, from monkeys, chimpanzees. So, we uh, looked at the story of how language evolved in its present form. We looked at how pidgins uh, are way stations which explain how uh, language developed slowly from the proto language which the uh, chimpanzees and gorillas spoke or the early humans spoke to the present form of language. So, that is what uh, the story was about in the first two lectures of looking at language and its history. Now, obviously, the second section focused on the research on language. So, we looked at the research process of doing language. We started off by explaining a piece of research uh, which is very famous in language research uh, which was the development of the N400 which is a event related marker for the semantic categorization. So, basically if semantic errors happen, we see the N400 and so, uh, so by describing that, I described to you the process of doing experimentation in language. We went into details of how hypotheses are made, how problems are constructed, what is the way of doing research in language, what are experiments, how do you do the experimental design, what are experimental groups and uh, the variations of designs like the between subject and within subject designs and that was the focus on uh, the, say, uh, the third and fourth lecture where we looked at the research design of doing language or how do we do research in language. In addition, we also looked at certain uh, basic uh, experiments in uh, language and we carried those experiments. Uh, we use those experiments as model to explain the research process in, in uh, language studies. We looked at uh, how the variables are defined and uh, what kind of variables are chosen for doing research in uh, the language. And lastly, we looked at the language and the brain, so areas of the brain which is related to language and in particularly we detailed the idea of uh, the Wernicke area and the Broca area, the Broca area known for production of speech and the Wernicke area which is perception of speech understanding meaning. So, that is what we did in lecture number uh, 3 and 4, we looked at the details of doing research in language. Now, obviously, once these two were clear, we started dwelling more into the idea of language. So, uh, the third uh, 
section, we jumped into the third section which is uh, lecture number 5 and 6, we looked at how speech is um, per, uh, perceived, how do you perceive speech or how do you listen to speech. So, we looked at the auditory system in detail, we looked at how sound behaves as a wave and we looked at the, uh, the function of the auditory canal and the function of the cochlea, the basal membrane, how they are arranged and in what way they perceive or they are able to uh, extract speech from sound waves. We also looked at uh, the speech stream, what is speech composed of? in terms of spectrograph. So, we looked at speech is continuous and so, we looked at the way the speech is uh, manifested or it is spoken. We looked at how uh, uh, vibrations, uh, how are vibrations expressed in terms of fundamental frequencies, uh, vibrations of the vocal fold, uh, fold and uh, what is phonation, uh, what is uh, uh, prosody and those kind of things we looked at and how prosody and phonation they help us in perceiving or understanding speech. Uh, we looked at uh, uh, the various characteristics of spoken language uh, which is uh, how vowels and uh, consonants are, um, uh, are expressed in the speech stream, what are formants and uh, things like uh, sorens, formants, fricatives, plosives, these are all characteristics of the speech. So, we looked at those kind of uh, uh, speech streams. We focused on how speech is perceived in categorical, speech is not perceived in a in, in uh, word by word, but they are uh, speech is perceived categorically. So, that is also another thing that we studied and we use Warren and Warren experiment uh, to uh, understand how speech is perceived categorically. And lastly, we looked at the development of speech perception, how speech uh, perception developed and we looked at uh, how infants uh, develop the speech or uh, develop um, uh, the speaking ability. So, we looked at uh, evidences to that and the various kind of um, uh, things related to infant speech uh, perception. And lastly, we focused on various theories of speech perception. So, we looked at three basic theories. We looked at the motor theory which believes that uh, speech is perceived through motor actions of uh, the various systems involved in speech. Um, we looked at a directly opposing theory which is uh, the auditory framework theory which opposes this idea that motor perception or gestures or the motor system which produces speech, the articulators which produce speech is anywhere involved in speech production. And so, the general auditory framework said the speech is like any other acoustic signal and it is not special. So, they provided evidences for that. And lastly, we focused on the idea of uh, uh, direct realism, which basically spe uh, talks about the idea that speech signal itself uh, has all the information necessary and so we do not need another theory of speech perception. Now, once we had understood how speech is perceived, how speech is listened to, uh, we thought about going uh, into a little bit detail about those apparatus which actually produce speech and so that was uh, lecture number 7, uh, where we looked at those apparatus which produce speech. So, we uh, started our journey by explaining the vocal tract and speech perception. So, how vocal tract actually uh, leads to the uh, phonation or the speech stream. So, we looked in detail uh, on those things of how the vocal tract is made and how it produces speech and how the glottis box or uh, they, they produce speech. So, we looked at how consonants and vowels are uh, produced and we looked at the various manners of constraint. So, basically consonant is produced by restricting the air which is coming from the vocal fold. So, restricting in some way. So, there are three ways of restriction, the manner of articulation, the voicing and the place of articulation. So, we looked into detail how consonants are produced and if we do not restrict the air which is coming out of the vocal fold, uh, we generally get a vowel and so vowel is basically uh, produced in, in, in coordination with the jaw, the tongue and uh, <coughs> mainly the jaw and the tongue. So, these positions, so we looked at how different vowels are uh, produced and the triangular theory of vowel. So, we looked into details onto those things. We looked at uh, 
how plosives in uh, affricates are produced and uh, several other uh, interesting facts related to uh, producing of speech, the vowel, the consonant and also the idea of what is a uh, diphthong and so on and so forth. We additionally, we looked at the speech areas of the brain. So, we looked at the Gashwin uh, Wernicke model where we talk about how speech is produced or what areas of the brain is involved in speech production. So, not only the Wernicke and the Broca area, we also looked at several other cerebral areas which are involved in production of uh, speech. So, uh, finally, we ended our lecture on the minimal network of overt speech production and that is what we are looking at uh, the three uh, minimal areas. So, we have the starting mechanism which starts with the supplementary motor cortex and uh, enterocingulate. We have the phonetic plan generation. So, this is done by Broca area and primary motor cortex and then you have the coordinating movement which coordinates the a movement of the, the vo vocal articulators and that is done by cerebral basal ganglia and thalamus. And so, this is where we ended. In today's lecture, what we are going to do is we are looking at models of speech perception. So, this is the from the last lecture where we looked at these areas, the basal ganglia, the global pallidus, the thalamus, the substantial nigria and cerebrum and these are the areas which are related to production of speech. So, in today's uh, lecture, what we are going to see is various models of speech production and the social aspect of speech. So, basically, if you look uh, into the world around you, the for any movement, let us say any uh, movement, if I want to um, grab a cup. Now, there are several movements which are there, a program has to be, a uh, mental program has to be created, a mental map has to be created, it signals the to the hand and the hand moves uh, from one position to another, picks up the uh, uh, and, and uh, the hand moves forward and there are two systems, a feedback system which tells the hand where to go and a feedback system which tells the hand where to stop. So, if, if the system says that move the hand forward, the hand should not overshoot the cup and so there is a feedback system which actually says that where it should stop and it gives you the accuracy of holding the cup. Now, similar to this program, the speech system it uh, movement are similar to limb movement. So, limb movement for uh, grabbing a cup is very similar to the systems that are available for um, uh, the uh, holding of or the speech articulation. And so, they involve the speech articulators, the uh, instruments or, or the parts of the body which produce speech, they are generally, uh, they involve the tongue, the jaw and the lips at various positions. So, the tongue, jaw and lips are the main articulators with the vocal fold uh, for producing speech. Now, the since the process is so rapid, uh, basically these three things are the one which you can see and other areas, uh, so other parts of the body are also involved which you do not actually see. So, uh, we have uh, here the feedback and the feed forward uh, control systems of speech. So, how uh, feedback and feed forward more models control speech or how they produce, how they uh, predict how speech is produced. Now, the feed forward control uh, or the feed forward processes, they provide the general motor plan for uh, moving a body part towards a goal position. So, the feed forward systems, they uh, give the general motor plan for moving the body part towards the goal and feed forward systems are those systems which actually tell you uh, how to start the uh, an action. Now, similarly, in the uh, feedback system, they adjust the forward trajectory based on real time information about likely success of the movement. So, if I start moving my limb or if I start speaking in the same way, the action or the signal to start speaking is done by the feed forward system, but feedback system will adjust the uh, articulators of what to speak and what not to speak and this is based on real time information which is coming. So, feedback system, they control and adjust the forward trajectory uh, based on real time information as it has been said here. Now, currently the models of uh, speech production generally assume a feedback and a feed forward system. Now, 
motor systems receive rapid feedback from somatic sensory systems, muscle tendons in joint and uh, feedback in speech production are done by somatic system and auditory system. Now, just as uh, uh, the feedback and feed forward system works in the limb, in the uh, voice also or in the speech production also, uh, we have the feedback and feed forward system. So, feedback system generally in terms of speech are done by somatic system, uh, the som somatosensory system and the auditory system. Now, in the speech production, the somatory system, somatosensory system provide continuous feedback on articulator uh, movement. So, basically the somatic system keeps on giving you real time feedback of, uh, of how the um, articulation is being done on uh, those uh, parts of the body which produce speech for example, the tongue, the jaw and the lip and the vocal fold. Now, auditory system feedback is also important, but auditory system feedback is a delayed system. Somatosensory system is a real time system, it tells you uh, what is the movement or how your various uh, um, jaw or uh, tongue is moving for producing speech, the auditory system is a late system. Now, the uh, for studying the uh, the auditory system, the somatory, somatosensory feedback system, we use something called the jaw perturbation technique, the jaw perturbation technique. And so, what is the jaw perturbation technique? It can be used uh, to test the hypothesis that motor speech systems uses somatosensory feedback to make corrections during articulation. So, the idea that somatos somatosensory system they make correction while making speech uh, that can be tested through this is the jaw perturbation technique. And so, what it is? It tests the somatosensory feedback in speech production. So, what do we do? We attach a robotic arm to the participant's jaw. So, the participant is asked to produce speech and a robotic, uh, robotic arm is basically attached to this part of the jaw, the lower jaw because that is the one which makes the movement. What the robotic arm does? It applies upward or downward force during vowel articulation. So, when somebody is producing uh, vowel, the uh, robotic arm is applying a upward and downward force. Now, participants rapidly adjust the, uh, the perturbation produced intended acoustic signal not gestures. So, what happens is when this happens the, uh, the uh, since the jaw the robotic arm is produ producing some force on the jaw, the participants is not able to produce uh, the, the right vowel, but what happens is when he, when he sees that when the jaw movement is there and when the somatosensory system it senses that an external force is, uh, is, is creating a fo uh, an external body is creating the force, it adjusts itself in real time to produce another vowel or another speech sound which is there. So, it adjusts itself in real time. For example, uh, people were asked to produce a uh, bet and they were asked to uh, an upward or downward force was produced and the upward force was produced. <coughs> the actual uh, uh, sentence that was produced by people was bait and when a downward force was there, they produce bat and so this is the correction that was done. Now, the finding from uh, these studies suggests that the goal of the speech motor plan is not the production of a particular gesture, but rather particular acoustic signal. So, these studies say that uh, the speech motor system goal. Uh, is for a production is, is not for a production of a particular gesture, but for the production of uh, or, uh, or uh, the correction of an acoustic signal. The exact role of auditory feedback in speech production is actually less clear. So, or, uh, this is for the somatosensory sens uh, sensory system, but what about the auditory system? The auditory system has also been uh, uh, held responsible for providing feedback. Now, the exact role of this auditory system is exactly uh, uh, a little bit not clear. The reason is that uh, there is a large time lag with auditory feedback since uh, sound waves need to travel from the mouth to the ears and to be produ uh, produced by the auditory cortex. Now, so matrix uh, sensory system is a real time system and so it provides real time uh, uh, corrections or feedback corrections onto uh, movements of the articulators, movement of those parts of the body which produce speech 
but the auditory signal or the auditory feedback is a slow feedback. The reason is that the word has to be produced by the mouth, it has to be heard by the ear and then processed by the auditory cortex only then it can produce a auditory feedback. Uh, the time lag is too great, so the time lag between producing the speech and hearing the speech is uh, too great to produce useful feedback during articulation of a syllable and so that is one of the reason. Now, what is the role of auditory feedback that can be tested in uh, or auditory uh, uh, feedback in speech production that can be tested by something called a auditory uh, perturbation technique. And so, what happens in the auditory perturbation technique? It is close the role of auditory feedback. Now, it tests the auditory feedback in speech production. What, uh, what is the technique like? It uh, participants speak into a microphone and listen through a headphone. So, you speak into a microphone and you hear your own speech in a headphone. What happens here is the computer modifies their speech. What it does is it delays the speech. So, your participants repeat a syllable into a microphone and listen through headphones of their own modified bias by a computer. The findings suggest uh, that we use auditory feedback not to make course correction of articulatory gestures in progress, but rather to adjust subsequent articulatory movements. So, we do not use it for course correction, but we use it for uh, subsequent uh, uh, the adjusting subsequent uh, articulatory movements. Since, this is a delayed signal, so it is used for uh, the next articulatory movement which is there. So, computer modifies the speech and so you use a, so you hear a modified speech and so participants generally compensate for the sound shift. So, you hear it later and so what, what you do is since, since some, but something has already been spoken, uh, the auditory signal it is not used for gesture correction, it cannot do gesture correction because it is a late signal. So, what it does it, it, it actually is used for compensation of the sound shift. So, if the sound is still being produced or it has been produced, so you compensate that and that is how the auditory um, uh, perturbation technique is used. Now, then there is something called uh, the auditory feedback is since auditory feedback is much slower than somatosensory feedback, sound exits mouth and re enters through the ears and somatosensory system information travels within the nervous system and so this is a slower uh, feedback and this is a faster feedback. Now, time lag too great to affect current production, but influences subsequent production and so that is what the auditory perturbation technique is. Now, this auditory, but the, uh, the auditory perturbation technique uh, suggests something called an auditory suppression happening during speech. An auditory suppression is, uh, it is it's, it's a technique in which uh, people, uh, they perceive their own act and when they perceive their own act. <coughs> they do not respond to it. For example, auditory suppression is similar to uh, the fact that if you tickle yourself, you will know that you are tickling and you will not laugh. So, basically those, those acts that you actually do on yourself, uh, uh, the goal is also perceived and so you, your response to that particular act is dampened and that is what is called auditory suppression. So, auditory suppression, it is a general principle of sensory motor system and expected sensory effects of self-initiated action uh, and uh, attenuated, that is what I am talking about, sensory effects of self initiated initiated action are attenuated or it is lower down. So, if you try <coughs> tickling yourself or if you try um, doing something to yourself, your response to that particular action will be attenuated. So, I have never seen somebody tickling himself and laughing and that is because of uh, the suppression auditory suppression. Now, the delayed auditory feedback uh, technique requires research participants uh, to speak while listening through headphones and their own voice which is delayed by a fraction of a second. And so, how is this auditory suppression actually tested? It is tested through something called a delayed auditory feedback technique. Right. So, what we are doing right now is we are focusing on the feedback systems for our auditory speech uh, production. So, we looked at the somatic sensory system and we are now looking at the auditory system and looking at the idea of auditory suppression. So, we use something called the uh, delayed auditory feedback technique. Now, here the participants speak into a microphone and listen through a headphone. Now, auditory returns delays by fraction of a second. So, when you uh, talk in the headphone, what happens is your speech is delayed artificially by a computer by fraction of a second. Now, when that happens, so even if 50 milliseconds can uh, severity uh, disrupt speech, if that happens, if you hear your speech at even 50 seconds later, people keep quiet and they are not able to complete their speech. Now, normal auditory feedback causes no disruption because it is expected, therefore, suppressed. Now, even if there is a time delay in, uh, in, in 
uh, your speech. So, or normally what happens is when you heat, when you speak something, uh, the uh, auditory system expects a delay in hearing it and so it suppresses itself, it suppresses uh, the, the sound which you are hearing in your own um, uh, ear. Uh, through your mouth, but if there is a delay in in the production of speech by your mouth and the hearing, even by 50 milliseconds, then it will cause an interference, and because of this interference, the speech will be affected. Now, uh, when you when you do that, uh, there is a disruption of auditory suppression. Now, this disruption of auditory suppression uh, it disrupts person's ability to actually speak. Now, recent EEG and neuroimaging shows that speech interference due to delayed auditory feedback is related to auditory suppression. So, this kind of thing where, where a fraction of a second is added or 50 millisecond delay is added into your speaking and your hearing that can interfere with your speak that has been proved by recent EEG and neuroimaging uh, techniques. Now, auditory suppression is related to the generally uh, general principle of somatosensory somatomotor system in which the expected sensory effects of a self initiated action is in attenuated and that is what we were talking about. This can be explained in in terms of something called the feed forward uh, feed forward model. Now, it explains some uh, model explains some uh, the sensory suppression. So, this particular uh, auditory suppression that when you hear your own voice, uh, it is suppressed by uh, the ear or the, the uh, speech production system that can be explained by uh, the results of that experiment can be explained by the feed forward model. It explains uh, sensory suppression by proposing that each time uh, the sensory motor system generates a motor command it also generates a predicted sensory consequence. So, when a sensory system gives a command for uh, the speech articulators or the speech organs to start talking, it also generates a predictive sensory consequence. It also tells uh, or it generates a consequence also from that particular act of speaking uh, for comparison against the actually sensory input. So, the sensory system not only gives a command to the articulators for producing speech, it also generates a consequence to that speech and uh, this consequence is compared to the in uh, uh, to the actual sensory input. Now, if the prediction and the input match the sensory experience is dampened uh, is dampened. Now, if the prediction and the input match. Now, if what what uh, you are hearing from your uh, so uh, when the somatosensory system it starts or it prepares your vocal cord or or the vocal system for speaking, it gives a command to the vocal system to speak. At the same time, it also produces or it also creates a uh, generates a uh, a, a predicted sensory uh, consequence that you are going to hear and so this these two it creates. So, when you speak and when this speech is heard by the ear and when the ear what it hears matches with what the somatosensory system has already suggested it is going to hear this will be dampened or the what you hear will be dampened the speech will be dampened and so you can speak. If you hear yourself at the same time as you are speaking, what will happen is or if it does not uh, dampen, what will happen is there will be a uh, break in your speech. So, sensory motor system it generates motor command also generates sensory uh, consequences. So, the speech system speech sensory system it generates two commands when it starts speaking. It generates a command a motor command to vocal areas for producing speech. At the same time, it also generates a sensory consequence that what it is going to say or what sound will be produced. Now, when, when the sound is actually uh, it, it starts from the mouth and reaches the ear and in the ear, if the ear is not able to hear or is, if, if what the ear is hearing and what it has it has been uh, said by the sensory sensory system that what it should hear if the match is not there then uh, there will be heightened reactions but if what the uh, the sensory 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 system uh, what consequence it produces or what it tells the ear that it is going to hear and what the ear hears if it is matching then a suppression happens to what you are hearing now comparison between prediction and input the uh, somatic uh, sensory system while producing speech will um, will produce 
uh, will send a motor command to generate a voice and this will be the input to the ear. At the same time, it will also produce something called uh, the consequence. It will also produce a signal for what consequence uh, will happen due to this particular uh, motor command or what sound it is going to hear. It will tell the ear. Now, if, if there is a match between what the ear is hearing and what has been what it has been suggested uh, to the ear that it will hear, then what will happen is there will be a dampening of the uh, sound that you are hearing from the ear. So, if there is a match, the signal uh, 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 signals correct output sensory experiences dampened and so what you hear will be dampened. Now, if there is a mismatch, signal production error, sensory experiences intensified. Now, if what you hear and into the input and what consequences have been said to you, if there is a mismatch, signal production error happens and sensory experiences are intensified and also input without prediction. Now, if you if there is no prediction, if the sensory system does not predict what you are going to hear, but you hear something from an input, signal external uh, it uh, signals an external event and sensory experiences are intensified and so here what happens is you uh, start thinking that it is not something that you have said, it will start thinking that it is coming from somewhere else and the sensory experience is intensified, it is not your sound and that is why there is no interference. So, when we speak, we are we, we uh, even if we hear, when we speak we also hear what we are speaking, but that does not uh, dampen our uh, speech system or that does not uh, dampen our, sp uh, that does not uh, interfere our speech because it is dampened, but if somebody else speaks then uh, the sensory consequences are not and so sensory experiences are um, is intensified and so we start hearing to them and responding to them. So, we do not respond to what we are speaking. So, auditory suppression is strictly a response to an uh, immediately prior speech event. Now, uh, uh, how uh, Nagarajan 2011, they suggested auditory suppression, uh, they prevent feedback interference during speech production. Now, by the time the auditory feedback reaches the speech motor uh, system, the command for the next articulatory gesture has already been sent. So, it provides no useful information whatsoever about the current state of, uh, state of speech production. Now, using the auditory feedback uh, speakers modify subsequent articulators to compensate when they hear their voice altered in unexpected way. So, what they what generally speech is uh, uh, auditory uh, sub, uh, the auditory speech signal does is it it since it is a late signal what it does is it only does a correction to later speech which is going to come. So, that is about the two feedback system uh, that is there in audit uh, in the auditory speech production. Now, there is a dual st uh, stream model which has been proposed for production of speech. So, what is this model? So, Allen and his colleagues in 2001, they mapped the dual processing system for audition. Now, this du uh, dual uh, model system, it is actually coming from, it is borrowed from visual perception. Now, in visual perception, the general organizing principle for sensory motor system, in, in visual product, uh, perception, you have two streams. There is a ventral stream and there is a dorsal stream. The vent ventral stream uh, which is running from the auditory cortex to the temporal lobe is basically recognition, object recognition and the dorsal stream which is running from uh, the occipital uh, cortex or the visual cortex to uh, the parietal lobe is basically for sensory, uh, for navigation, for spatial movement. Now, these two systems are uh, very popular in, in uh, the visual perception and they have been borrowed in auditory perception also. Now, the ventral stream uh, in, in, in the visual or any sensory motor system system through temporal lobe processes what information object identification in the visual uh, uh, as I said in the visual stream uh, the temporal lobe process is about what information is being said what is an object so object recognition and the dorsal stream parietal lobe from the occipital lobe it it's, uh, looks at something called how information earlier it was called the what information what am I uh, uh, why information why am I seeing later on it was identified into how the spatial since since the dorsal stream will uh, talk about navigation or the dorsal stream is involved in, in navigation it is about what uh, or uh, <coughs> how the particular navigation has to be done now the dual stream model has be, uh, for speech production has been provided uh, processed by or has been proposed by uh, hicklock and popel in 2007 now, the speech production system according to Allen and his colleagues in 2001, uh, the speech perception system is organized into the what 
system which is the ventral stream and how which is the dorsal stream. So, uh, Allen and uh, 2001 it says that the speech production system are uh, processed or it has been divided into the ventral stream and the dorsal stream. The ventral stream is the what system and the dorsal stream is the how system. So, Hillock and Popel 2007 they propose in speech perception and uh, the ventral seam is a bilateral processing pathway. The ventral seam that you see in speech perception, so speech perception is basically having two streams of information or there is two ways of processing. There is a ventral way or a ventral stream of processing of uh, speech and there is a dorsal stream. The ventral stream starts from the temporal lobe to the uh, auditory cortex and the dorsal stream it starts from the parietal lobe to the auditory uh, in, uh, information. Now, what is the ventral stream according to um, Hillock and Popel, what does it composed of? So, um, the ventral stream is a bilateral processing pathway. So, ventral stream is bilateral which means that it is in the both hemispheres. Uh, and interprets the meaning of the incoming speech signal. So, it is first of all it is a bilateral which means that it is parallel there are two ventral streams first of all and then what it does is it interprets meaning of the incoming speech. In comparison to that the dorsal stream is basically a uh, left hemisphere processing pathway. So, it is not on the right hemisphere the dorsal stream is a left hemisphere processing pathway and it links incoming speech signal with motor programs. So, what does it do? Uh, it, it links the incoming speech signal. The ventral stream makes the meaning of the incoming speech, uh, uh, incoming speech and the dorsal stream takes the incoming uh, uh, sleep, uh, the speech signal and it links this speech signal into the speech motor programs. So, that what should be said. So, something is said and your ear hears that it takes this signal and then the meaning is <coughs> of this speech is done by the ventral system, but this speech is heard by the dorsal system and it sends a signal, uh, somatic sends a signal to the auditory, uh, uh, to the uh, voice producing areas, the vocal areas um, to articulate the next speech that is what the dorsal the system does it sends a motor signal. The ventral stream is basically what does it mean and the dorsal stream is basically how do you say that. So, it is a left hemisphere processing pathway it links incoming speech signals with the motor signals. Now, traditionally the traditional view that language is lateralized to the uh, left side of the brain. Now, neuroimaging studies it suggests that both hemispheres of the cerebral cortex and a number of subcortical systems are recruited for speech processing. So, it says that not only left hemisphere, but both hemispheres are involved in speech processing. Now, there are parallel ventral streams in both the hemispheres with the right hemisphere processing meaning over large time scales. So, the, the right hemisphere process meaning and it takes a long time for processing meaning and the left hemisphere process, uh, processing is for a short period of time and it is analytical processing that the left hemisphere actually does. Now, the dorsal stream uh, originates in the speech perception area in the uh, lateral fissure which is the Wernicke area and extends to the posterior inferior uh, the posterior inferior frontal gyrus which is the Broca area as well as the primary motor cortex of the left hemisphere. So, that is what it is the dorsal stream is in the uh, it starts from the Wernicke area and goes to the uh, Broca area. Now, in the model the ventral stream provides an interface between uh, Pro, uh, processing below the level of word which is phoneme, prosody and syllables. Now, this model of dual speech system it says that the ventral streams provides an interface for processing those sounds uh, or uh, processing those aspects which are below the level of the word. For example, the, uh, the at the level of phones prosody and syllables and processing at the word level or also processing at above word level for example, sentence and discourse. So, this kind of processing below uh, word level and uh, above word level the interface of processing these are through the ventral stream. Now, the ventral stream uh, ac accounts for clinical and neuroimaging data required for retrieval of words from their uh, meaning that is what the specification of ventral stream means. Now, what is the dorsal stream? Now, the dual stream looks a lot like the Wernicke. Uh, so, basically how does the dual stream model it compensates uh, or it, it 
it matches with the older theory of uh, Wernicke and, Gish, uh, and uh, uh, Gashin that we have looked at. What happens is, what is the similarities between them or how, do, how does the dual stream accommodate those theories? First, the dual stream looks a lot like wernicke gishwan model. So, it is basically the same kind of uh, interpretation which is there. Also, the dorsal stream, it provides a mechanism for motor theory. The dorsal stream provides a reason that motor theory of speech perception is somewhat correct. Also, the dorsal stream also provides a mechanism to account for phonological short term memory. So, this is the uh, dual uh, model and this is the details of the dual stream model of speech production. Now, there is another model of speech production which is called, so this is what it is. You have the auditory feedback Y subcortical nuclei, the somatosensory feedback Y subcortical nuclei to articulate musculature for subcortical nuclear. You have the articulate velocity and position maps, feedback control maps, auditory error maps, somatosensory error maps, feedback control systems are there and this is feed forward control system and this feed feedback feed, control, uh, feed forward control system generally are used for production of speech. And this is uh, how the DIVA model actually works. So, uh, this is uh, basically that was the DIVA model that I explained. So, it should have come later on. Uh, this is the how the dual stream model really works. This is the dorsal stream, this is the ventral stream. So, it uh, you have the articulatory network, somatosensory interface, input from other sensor modalities, you have conceptual network here, phonological network here, lexical interface here, somatos uh, temporal analysis here and combination networks here. And so, these are the two uh, Wernicke and how the information in the left and right hemisphere, they interact for producing the speech stream. And beside that, we have another theory which is called the DIVA theory, the DIVA theory. Now, DIVA is basically a computational model of speech perception. So, what does it say? So, DIVA incorporates all the functional brain region uh, organizing them into feed forward and feedback theory. So, it is basically a computational model. What is a computational model? A computer program simulates cognitive processes that is what a computational model does and it is consistent with what is currently known about human cognition. So, uh, example uh, for example, you have the ACTR and ACT star. Uh, uh, or the uh, sonar and these are computational models for um, uh, cognition uh, which are provided by Anderson. Similarly, in, in uh, uh, linguistics in psycholinguistics, you have the DIVA program which is a computational model. What does the model do? Uh, it incorporates all functional brain region into feed forward and feedback models. So, model both speech production and speech acquisition, it organizes functions brain regions into feed forward and feedback control systems. So, basically the feed forward system programs the motor command for speech and on all uh, which include the somatosensory motor area, the Broca area and the motor cortex area. So, the feed forward system, it programs the motor command for speech. The, uh, in according to DIVA model, the feed forward system, it programs uh, the, uh, the, the those motor area or motor sequences for speech production and somatosensory and auditory targets, the expected sensory consequences are sent to feedback control systems. Somatosensory system and auditory system which are feedback system, they are sent uh, to feedback control systems where they are compared against the actually sensory input. So, auditory uh, uh, feedback and somatosensory feedback, they are sent back to control systems which are there for uh, feedback and they compare the actual sensory input input with uh, what the input it is receiving, the ear is receiving. Now, any detected auditory or somatosensory errors, if the control system it gets any kind of um, uh, error uh, which, which may be a somatosensory error or an auditory error, uh, they are sent to feedback control map. Now, this has been this again is sent to a feedback control map which sends feedback to motor cortex to modify its motor, uh, motor command and articulators. So, if, if the uh, somatosensory system and auditory system it detects an error into what it has what the speech has been produced and what the ear is hearing this error is sent to something called the control map which where the control map processes this information and sends it back to the motor cortex to modify the motor command for articulator. So, if it sees an error, if what you are speaking is not what you are hearing or what is expected, what will ha happen is the articulators, the speech articulators, the jaw or the tongue or, or uh, the lips or the vocal fold, they will be adjusted. Now, D y is basically uh, the, uh, called the directions into velocities of articulators. Now, what are the con contributions of this DIVA system? Wha what does it propose? First of all, it proposes a new way of thinking about the Broca area. Traditionally, Broca area was about speech 
uh, 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 speech production or, or production of speech areas. Now, Broca is according to the DIVA system, Broca is a spatial area which is used for speech production, speech perception and gesture production. So, both perception and production and gesture, gesture uh, production is also done by Broca area. Also, Broca area serves as a speech sound map. Also, Broca area serves as a speech sound map where any error that the uh, kind of feedback control system, it detects in the somatosensory or the auditory feedback and it sends an information to the speech, uh, the speech sound map which is in the Broca area where mirror neurons representing speech sounds uh, whether perceive or produce are located. So, basically this uh, uh, the, the control map that we have been talking about in the DIVA is in the Broca area. Also DIVA explains uh, both adult speech production and infant speech development in the same framework. What it says is that infants early babbling which is random and uh, repetitive is driven by the feedback control system. Now, as infants babble it receives sensory feedback that it uh, that it can compare against the speech samples it has already experienced. So, when infant starts babbling what happens is that the infant uh, generally first when he is babbling it just babbles, but when the ear hears the infant hears his own babbling and compares this with the actual sound of uh, what an adult is saying it modifies its articulators, it modifies this uh, the way it is producing speech and so basically DIVA provides a uh, reasoning for how this happens. So, reinterpret the Broca area as a speech sound map and also explains uh, uh, but adult speech production and infant speech production development in the same framework. So, that is what the uh, DIVA system is and this is how the DIVA system works. So, you have this uh, feed, uh, feed forward control system, you have a feedback control system and then you have something called the semi error map, feedback control map and uh, this is how the articulators are again uh, send back information to uh, control. And so, this is the dorsal happening. Now, how does uh, development of speech production happen? Now, how does infants develop speech or how does uh, speech development happen um, uh, or uh, the development of speech production happen. Now, infant come into the world screaming and for the next few months crying is main form of communication. So, basically they start with something called screaming the infants are uh, the infants come in the world with screaming and then later on they cry, but after that uh, whole process is there of speech production or development of speech production in them and that starts with babbling. So, infants go through uh, predictable stages of babbling during the first year. So, babbling is the same muku sound that the infant is producing and how this babbling actually leads to the production of speech is what we are going to learn here. So, regardless of language spoken even, even with profound hearing loss. So, uh, you have something called stage, uh, stages of babbling. So, from the first 6 months infants progress through predictable stages of vocalization. The first 6 months are, uh, are uh, predictable areas of uh, or predictable stages of vocalization. First is the phonation stage. In this from birth to 2 months infant produce vowels like sounds by vibrating the vocal cords. So, first 2 months the infants produce vowels and these are uh, vowel like sound uh, which is like uh, which is not babbling exactly. So, it is vowel like sound and uh, they are produced by vibrating the vocal cord. Now, they have little control over the artic art, uh, articulators and they rarely produce a consonant. So, they produce a vowel, but not a consonant as they say. At the going stage which is 2 to 4 months infant produce syllables uh, like sounds in back of their vocal tract for example, ku or gu both consonant vowels are poorly formed and highly variable, but they start producing consonant and vowel by 2 to 4 months uh, by producing uh, sound in the back of the vocal tract, but these sounds are like uh, very poorly formed vowels and uh, consonants. Now, there is an expansion stage which is 4 to 6 months infant produce a variety of different sounds well formed vowels such as e, e and a, h and consonants like uh, sounds are uh, uh, produce and this is called marginal babbling. So, from 4 to 6 months infants are able to produce full vowels like E vowel like the A vowel. So, back of the tongue, front of the tongue by jaw lower position, jaw upper position and so they are produce able to produce these vowels, but uh, some consonants they are able to produce and this is called the marginal babbling sound. Now, there is a canonical babbling stage also which is from 6 to 10 months and this is pre-linguistic vocalization and it is characterized by sequence of clearly formed consonant vowel syllables. 
first produced in isolation for example ba then reduplicated so first the infants are in first stage of the infants are able to produce clearly um, consonants in isolation for example ba then they are able to reduplicate the syllables uh, for example not one just ba but they can produce ma ma so uh, in the first stage they are able to just produce ma 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 like that and later on they are able to reduplicate this vowel and produce two which is uh, ma ma and then later they can produce a variegated syllable like daddy which is more of uh, 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 more than replication of a single syllable. Now, consonant consisting of mainly oral and nasal stop produced with lips or tongue. So, uh, uh, the, at the uh, canonical babbling stage, they are able to produce consonants with oral and nasal stop. For example, the B sound, the D sound, the M sound, and the N sound. And caregivers they respond to canonical babbling as they are uh, intentional speech. So, basically they are able to produce these kind of speech early there are several stages of babbling which we talked about and the infant goes through these stages of babbling. So, that is how the babbling starts. Now, caregivers often mimic infant vocalization and they provide social feedback encouraging infants to babble more help infants in their on their vocalization. As in uh, babbling becomes more speech like caregivers respond as if they were intentional speech and baby's first word develops out of babbling sequences. So, basically that is how it is. So, infants they when they produce this babbling the caregivers they respond to the canonical babbling and as if they were intentional speech sounds. Now, these are the stages of babbling the phonation stage, the going stage, the expansion stage in the canonical babbling and these are the uh, things that we were talking about. Now, there is something called a frame then content model uh, which is there for speech production. So, what is there? It says it says that early vocalizations they are strictly driven by motor systems and not auditory feedback. So, early vocalizations of an infant they are driven by motor systems and not by auditory feedback and so they are um, basically then uh, the idea is that they are universal in nature and infants are uh, uh, early vocalization is universal in nature also deaf children go through the same stages. So, the frame then content model actually explains the babbling in terms of repeated job means. So, we are coming to that. So, Davies and McNeilage 1994 proposed the theory that explains babbling in terms of jaw movement. So, this theory was given by someone called Davies and McNeilage and so what do they say? According to the model babbling begins around 6 to 8 months. They say that babbling begins around 6 to 8 months because this is where the infant gains control over the jaw. The infant when he is born he is not able to control the jaw and so he cannot produce speech but by the time from 6 to 8 months of his birth the infant is able to control the jaw and able to produce babbling. Now, infants will make jaw movements without vocalization but sometimes phonation results. So, uh, you uh, initially the infant will produce the jaw movement and so the movement will be alone there and nothing will be there, but later on there will be some phonation also. So, jaw oscillation plus vocal fold vibration will syllable like vocalizations. Jaw oscillation accompanied by vocal fold vibration is a sequence of vocalization then sound like simple consonant vowel sound. So, certain speech sounds will be produced which are more basic than others appears first in babbling. So, uh, jaw oscillation which is accompanied by vocal fold. So, jaw oscillation accompanied by vo vocal fold vibration uh, they sound like simple vocalization that happens. So, as initially what happens is they control the jaw uh, the infant is able to control the jaw but and move the jaw but nothing comes out of it. Later there is some fo uh, phonation and after that there is jaw oscillation uh, and this jaw oscillation in association with the vocal fold vibration the infants are able to produce simple uh, uh, syllable like vocalization. The model also stipulate that certain speech sounds are more basic than others appearing first in in, uh, in uh, canonical babbling. For example, the uh, lab, uh, the label consonants B, M, W, the L over uh, the L over consonant D and Y, the velar consonants which is N and G and the basic vowels of A, E, O, they are able, they are able, being able to produce by the infants. So, nearly all languages make use of consonants produced with the lip which is B and M, the tip of the tongue which is D and N. Uh, and back of the tongue which is G and NG. Now, since uh, this is common to all languages all infants goes through or all infants are able to produce this speech sound. Now, all languages distinguish vowels based on tongue position front EE, uh, central AH and back 
oh, as we have shown that basic vowels are also produced. Now, early bab babbling features all speech sounds narrowed later to phoneme inventory of language. This is the old theory. So, the old theory says that babbling features or uh, uh, when when the uh, infant is producing early early babbling, now they are producing all kind of sounds and later on they are by listening to the adults, they uh, constrict these sounds and are able to uh, fit their uh, babbling or producing sound into the phonation of the, in, uh, their uh, language, mother language which they are going to speak. Now, infant, but new theory says that infant speech sound is highly variable, but cent centered on most basic speech sound common to all world language. It basically says that most infants produce the same kind of speech when they start. Now, uh, these uh, should be predictable patterns of consonant vowel pairs in babbling as opposed to random mixtures of consonants and vowels. Models suggest three pa patterns will prevail. So, infant speech sound production highly variable, but centered on these basic speech sound. All consonant vowel combination occur, but certain combinations are more likely than other combinations. So, as, as we said typical babbling syllables, the model suggests that three patterns will prevail. You have a central pattern, you have a frontal pattern and a back pattern. So, if the tongue happens to be in the central position during babbling, uh, the lips will constrict. Uh, the vocal tract will and uh, when the jaw closes will produce consonants like b m w so b m n w and vowels like a n u so they are able to produce this now if the tongue is in the front position tongue and uh, it lips will constrict the vocal tract by meeting the teeth producing consonants like d n y and also producing vowels like e a and a y. So, when that uh, tongue is in the front position, but the tongue is in the back position, the back of the tongue will meet, the root of the tongue will strike the velum and they are able to produce consonants like g and n g and vowels like o and o h. So, these are these are the vowels, these are the consonants the uh, infant is able to produce and these are the vowels that the infant will be able to produce. Now, the reasonable conclusion from this model is that these babbling patterns are driven by motor and not by auditory uh, 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 processes. Now, let us look at the social aspects of babbling. First, the parents interpret the infant uh, babbling as an attempt to speech. So, caregivers they respond to babbling as if it was an invitation to conversation. Now, imitate babbling with confines of their own language. So, what they do is they uh, imitate the babbling with confines of their own language. So, they produce the right sound and or they produce the sound which is similar to the babbling sound and so the infant listens to that and they uh, are able to respond. So, when babies bab uh, babble parents imitate them and the auditory feedback helps the infant to home in on the sound categories of the language it is learning. Infants use babbling to elicit responses from caregivers. So, the infants use this feedback modified babbling sound to uh, like caregivers language. Now, there is something called object direct vocalization. So, when the in, uh, caregiver or the parent are speaking to the infant, they use something called object directed vocalization. They show the uh, infant particular objects and uh, speak the name of the object in the same babbling language of the infant. So, object directed vocalization babbling uh, uttered as infant approaches and manipulates the novel objects. So, babbling uttered as infant approaches and manipulates a novel object. Uh, parents respond by naming the object. So, when an infant touches an object, the parent respond by naming the object with a word that matches the bab bab babble. So, you have to be very sure or you are, the, the point here is that the object that the infant is touching or manipulating, the parent responds to that uh, babbling by producing a name of the object which matches the babble and the, the babble that the um, uh, child is doing and that is very important. Now, infant who receive this kind of feedback have large vocabulary. So, infants who get this kind of feedback from uh, uh, from the caregivers or parents, they have large vocabularies, then infants who do not get this kind of feedback. So, caregivers respond with name for an object that resemble the babble and indicate infants heightened attention and readiness to learn. So, parents often treat babble as a meaningful speech. 
Now, there are something called speech delays and disorders. Now, hearing impairment they go undetected till second year of life. Uh, uh, control vibrations of vocal cord and jaw movement same in it has been found that for the deaf and the normal people the jaw movement and vocal cord vibration are same. However, coupling of phonation and articulation is impaired in deaf suggesting that this is an auditory feedback. So, this is they do not hear the coupling does not happen the jaw movement and the vibration of the vocal cord happen, but this is not able to hear it they are not able to couple the phonation and articulation uh, of the speech sound. So, hearing impairment may not be detected during the first year because infants still babble. Now, the sole expressive uh, development delay in babbling or talking in spite of developing receptive natural uh, language uh, interaction skills at normal lag. So, delay in babbling is not always caused by hearing impa impairment, the delay in babbling is caused uh, sometimes caused by slow expressive development. For example, a delay in babbling in in spite of developing receptive language and social uh, in in, in uh, interaction skill at a normal rate. So, it can happen due to slow expressive development. It can also happen due to childhood apixia of speech in which child child children experience severe difficulty in producing speech in spite of normal cognitive perceptual and motor skills. So, you uh, it could happen due to uh, uh, slow expressive development or it could also happen due to childhood uh, apraxia of speech which is a severe difficulty to producing speech even though the cognitive perceptual and motor skills are the um, uh, children are normal. Now, they also mispronounce certain phonemes uh, and can hear two phonemes, but use only one. So, for example, this is called the fish phenomena child can clearly hear a distinction between the two phonemes which has been said to them fish for example, but uses on but can only use one phoneme and this is called the fish phenomena. Children also do something called uh, in uh, or children who have late speech development they also uh, produce something called phoneme uh, rest, uh, substitution and there is also something called the residual speech error which is misarticulation that persists in elementary school years. So, residual speech errors is uh, uh, misarticulation uh, that persists into the elementary school years. For example, uh, sometimes speech production uh, is 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 uh, basically affected by residual speech error. For example, the pronunciation of the L and the R sound, and so that happens. And also fricative and affricates made by the tongue for S and SH, so they make error in this also. So she may call fish, but she will correct, but she will correct you if you call them that. So. Uh, when the adult says fish, the child is not able to say or the fish, the two phonemes that it is hearing, the f i and s h uh, that, that it is hearing. So, she will be saying, the child will be saying fish, but if the adult says fish, she will be able to correct you saying that this is wrong, it is fish. She will write the fish sound, but she is, the child is not able to produce the, uh, the two phonemes together and so that is another error which is out there. And so, that brings us to the end of this section, end of this lecture where we are looking at uh, how uh, the uh, um, the voice is or the speech is produced. So, what we did here is we looked at uh, the feed forward and feedback control systems. The feed forward system controls the muscular art articulator or the articulators which produce feed and the feedback system it uh, provides feedback onto what speech is produced and provides this error correction does the error correction. So, the two ways one is the somatosensory system uh, based feedback and then is the auditory uh, <coughs> system big, uh, based feedback. Then we looked at the two stream, the dual stream model, where we looked at uh, the ventral stream and the dorsal stream and how the ventral stream and the dorsal stream they combine together to lead to speech production. Further to it, we looked at the DIVA model, which is another model and a more complicated computational model, which explain how speech is produced. And so, they talk about the feedback and feed, for, feed forward systems and the integration of two, two system of producing speech and correction of speeches and they integrate the whole uh, <coughs> idea of speech production which has been captured up till now. Further to that we looked at how speech is uh, developed in children, we looked at the idea of babbling, the several stages of babbling which are there and how uh, these babbling lead to the actual speech 
production or development of speech production in small children or infants. We looked at several stages of it and how it is developed. Further to that, we also pointed out or we also looked at the social consequences of the speech production, how caregivers respond to uh, the children and how object identification uh, task is used uh, for uh, developing a bab babbling and how this babbling leads to further speech production in children. And lastly, we looked at some kind of speech errors in children, uh, uh, the speech errors like for name uh, the uh, fish phenomena, the residual speech error, the childhood apexia and slow expressive development and how these are, uh, what kind of disorders are they and how these uh, disorders can lead to uh, either later babbling or uh, the slow production of speech in children. So, all in all what we did is uh, we in the, uh, in the last lecture we looked at how speech is uh, produced and in this lecture we looked at the several theories of speech production. Uh, or how speech is produced. Now, when we meet next, we will start another uh, round or more complex things in speech production, which is at the, so at the, we, at, uh, now we were focusing on the phone level, the phonetic level or the basic speech sounds. Now, we will start with uh, looking at what are words and how words are produced and what are the uh, nature of word production and what is the uh, way the words are produced and how they are handled and things like that. We will move to sentences, we will look into discourse and so on and so forth. So, next lecture we will deal with what are words, what is word actually and what is the construction of this, what is the nature of this. But until we do that, which is in the next lecture, which is lecture number 9, we will meet again and it is goodbye and namaste from here. Thank you.